Now, where to begin? Ah, oh, yes. Nearly a full year has passed since Amazon released their exorbitant financial boondoggle, The Rings of Power. A gift for Prime members the world over, which was received with about the same amount of enthusiasm as a sack of flaming turds on the doorstep. And poop again! This lack of fervor could in part be attributed to the self-aggrandizing marketing campaign which saw cast and crew members hailing the show's inclusion of elves and dwarves of color, rather than paying respect to Middle-Earth's maker or generating any buzz for the story they plan to tell. Now, now we see us, now we're here, we are heard, we are seen. It is our time and it's our turn. There will no longer be, longer be a time where you can say there are no elves of color. And the first time that see, we see a black woman in this area and this world and these works of Tolkien. This represents progression. This represents an acknowledgement of where we have been and um, a will to get to where we need to be. Somebody kill me! And then once it landed on the platform, it was met largely with contempt from fans, YouTubers, and even a few publications out there. Though rest assured, plenty of critics were there to pick up the ball and run it right into Rotten Tomatoes end zone. And I won't lie, watching my favorite content creators mock all things mid-earth on a weekly basis was both fun and amusing, and in many ways played a role in spurring me forward in the creation of this very channel. And while those same creators who derided it certainly affected my expectations for both quality and enjoyment, I always intended to let the dust settle before giving it a watch myself and formulating my own thoughts. I have no problem going against the grain if I genuinely like something or think it's not as awful as everyone says. Not so bad. If it has merits worth defending, I am ready to raise my shield. Though if you'd told me back then that I'd be dropping a video of this length in detail about just the first episode, I would have likely responded, It can't be done, you're crazy! I'll also note that while I did see reactions to episodes which tended to follow their initial airing, I avoided any and all detailed analyses. Season 1 has been rather thoroughly dissected by creators far more seasoned than myself, so I harbor no delusions that my own breakdown will contain only fresh observations. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me if each one I make has been spotted by some amalgam of fellow observers, or perhaps the EFAP crew on a given Saturday. All the same, if my own remarks end up echoing those of others, I assure you that I'm not parroting or mimicking them, but rather plucking fruit from the same tree. While I do hope that some observations will be fresh, not to mention correct, my larger goal is that the presentation itself will be informative as well as entertaining and interesting for you, in great contrast to what I'm about to watch if its reputation is to be believed. And finally, a couple of things about where I'm coming from as I watch this series. For one, I'm well aware of several major spoilers. This naturally means that if a certain plot twist I have knowledge of was intended to shock, its chances of doing so are now basically zero. But I don't think that's really all that important because the shock of a plot twist is pretty much a one-time thing. It should still be able to hold up on rewatch and against foreknowledge. One thing the series may or may not have working in its favor as I watch it is a fair lack of knowledge of J.R.R. Tolkien's lore on my part. I have read the most well-known of Tolkien's books, albeit many years back, watched the Lord of the Rings movie trilogy many times over, trudged through the Hobbit films, and seen a lore video here and there, but I'm far from being a Tolkien scholar. I'm also more than willing to give the show creative leeway when it comes to making changes in story and character, so long as those changes prove positive. So who knows, maybe I'll discover myself to be a great fan of Rings of Power and become one of its sole defenders. Only one way to find out. What in the blue f was that? I have so many questions. So, let's dive into this dumpster fire titled A Shadow of the Past. Nothing is evil in the beginning. We begin with elvish children playing in the fields of Valinor when the world was young. Away from this group of younglings sits little Galadriel, muttering to herself as she folds a boat from a piece of paper. The others approach, and then one boy begins to taunt her, saying that even she can't believe that thing's going to float. It's not going to float. It's going. To sail. Uh, maybe I'm nitpicking, but if your boat doesn't have a sail, then it's merely a floater. She sets her creation into the water, and then, as if it were a Middle Eastern wife caught in the act of adultery, the children begin to toss stones at it. 
Then one well-placed throw from the toxic boy elf sinks the vessel faster than the Goya. Galadriel angrily rushes the lad, pins him to the ground, and just as she is ready to strike, her brother Finrod comes along and stops her from committing any violence. And you know, that takedown by the girl was fairly skillful given her age. Are we quite sure that the blood of Mary, daughter of Sue, doesn't course through young Galadriel's veins? Finrod then fishes the sunken vessel from the water and decides it's high time to teach his sister a nautical lesson. Do you know why a ship floats and a stone cannot? Because they're made of wood. Good! <laughs> the stone sees only downward. A stone doesn't see anything because it doesn't have eyes. The ship feels the darkness as well, striving moment by moment to master her and pull her under. Fenrod, do yourself a favor and read some Archimedes. But the ship has a secret. Water displacement. It's not a secret. Her gaze is not downward but up. Fixed upon the light that guides her, whispering of grander things than darkness ever knew. Oh, I see. It's a metaphor. A metaphor so lame that it wouldn't take up space on my own refrigerator if my child wrote it. And I'm struggling with the idea that a child didn't write it, as well as the fact that an adult was paid to do so. And not only is it dumb, but the circumstances which led to this, that being a rough and tumble over a paper boat, don't seem to justify the lesson. He doesn't even relate the lesson to the scuffle. I'm reminded of Batman Begins when young Bruce Wayne falls into a well, breaks his arm, and then is attacked by bats, and then his father takes the opportunity to tell his son that such things happen so that people can learn to pick themselves up again. That made perfect sense as a time to instruct him in this fashion. Now imagine if the boy had only tripped and scraped his knee, and yet the scene was filmed the exact same way. Same music, same dialogue, same pearl of wisdom. We would obviously see this as laughably contrived, as if the writers were forcing words into the characters' mouths, as well as imposing ridiculous behavior upon them over an injury that just requires a kiss and a band-aid. Doesn't make sense. That's pretty much what we have here with Finrod and Galadriel. But the good news is, is that it gets so much worse from here. But sometimes... The lights shine just as brightly reflected in the water as they do in the sky. It's hard to say which way is up and which way is down. No, it really isn't. If the light you're looking at is moving with the waves and you had to tilt your head down to see it, then that's a good indicator of which way is down. How am I to know which lights to follow? I'm really failing to see the point of this metaphor at all. Yes, I'm aware that he's instructing her to choose a righteous path rather than an unrighteous one, but what even prompted him to do so? This is supposedly a world that, as of yet, has not been infected with evil. So such a path shouldn't even exist as far as they know. Fenrod then rather frustratingly decides to whisper his answer in Galadriel's ear because, while there isn't another elf but the two of them in the vicinity, he's apparently aware there is an at-home audience watching. And as barren as the attendants might be, we're not supposed to hear. But that seems so simple. The most important truths often are. <sighs> okay, before we continue, I must warn you, while the dialogue thus far has been more than a tad rough from the outset, we haven't even begun to see the stupidity this script is capable of delivering. What follows might seem a rather mundane version of a fairly typical piece of advice, but when considering the type of being speaking and the world this person is inhabiting, it is genuinely mystifying. But you must learn to discern them for yourself. I won't always be here to speak them to you. Galadriel asks what he means by this, but he doesn't answer and beckons her to come home with him. But we cannot let this go just yet. You won't always be there. What exactly is Fenrod implying when he says this? As of yet, we've been introduced to a world which, again, is without evil, but also without conflict. On top of that, Fenrod is an elf. And last time I checked, elves are immortal. Furthermore, he and his sister are having this conversation in Valinor, which comes to be known as the Undying Lands. Am I seriously meant to believe that Fenrod knows he's going to die? 
what exactly is this based on? And before anyone chimes in with, Elves have the gift of foresight, thereby implying that he has foreseen his demise, I would direct you to the very next line. We had no word for death, for we thought our joys would be unending. There is absolutely no reason whatsoever for Finrod to suggest what he's suggesting. Death isn't merely an event of low probability for the elves. It is something that, as far as they know, doesn't even exist. The concept itself is completely foreign to them. So foreign, in fact, that they don't even have a word for it. Now really think about that for a moment. Generally, when something new is discovered or a new idea is conceived, real or fake, there is an almost immediate mental exercise which follows in which a name and or description is given to such things. These occurred in the mind of J.R.R. Tolkien when he conceived of Middle-earth and the creation and conflicts which inhabit this world which weren't already named. The man even created languages specifically for this world. This is why the potential excuse of elvish foresight simply doesn't work. Even if there hasn't been death up to this point, if you are envisioning your own or someone else's end, you naturally would come up with a descriptor for that which you are anticipating. Furthermore, Galadriel also just said that they thought their joys would be unending. So again, I have to wonder why she is asking or being taught about paths to choose from and the difference between darkness and light in relation to them. As far as she should know, the only path forward is good. I've seen a number of horses stumble out of the gate and I fear this one might have broken both legs in the process. Are we sure we can't just go ahead and put it out of its misery? No? Okay, we'll continue. Galadriel then narrates how the light of Valinor was snuffed out by the great foe Morgoth. In response, the elves send an army to the distant lands of Middle-earth where the forces of good and evil do battle in a war that would last for centuries. Eventually, we are told Morgoth's armies are defeated while many an elf perish in the conflict. Now, we learned many words for death. As well as how to neatly stack helmets into a 20-foot pyramid? Orcs are said to have spread to every corner of Middle-earth under the command of Sauron, Morgoth's most devoted servant. Fenrod vows to hunt down the Dark Lord, but is sadly killed in the process by Sauron himself. And so meaningful was this particular kill that Sauron left upon his body a mark which, to paraphrase Galadriel, was undecipherable even to the wisest of her kind. So, Sauron marked his defeated foe with an indiscernible symbol, did he? Why would he do this? Is Sauron the type to mark his victims like some kind of serial killer? Does he brand all whom he kills this way? Well, it turns out the answer to this is no, because after Morgoth's defeat, Sauron disappears. And after Galadriel resolves to take up Fenrod's quest to hunt down the enemy, she states that this is the only clue the elves have to go on. For centuries, Galadriel leads a company of elves across Middle-earth, hunting for her brother's killer. So much time passes that many of her people believe that Sauron is a thing of the past. In the present day, we catch up to her ascending a frozen mountain with such swiftness and determination that she easily outstrips her men as they climb ever closer to a place where it is rumored a last stronghold of Sauron is nearby. Once they've reached the top, one of her companions, an elf named Thondir, begins to question the necessity of this venture, suggesting that perhaps they should rest and then begin the journey back home as all the other commanders are amongst those who think that Sauron is no more. Galadriel's response is to give him one of the most uncomfortably awkward stares I think I've ever seen. They make their way through a furious snowstorm, lightning flashing all around them. They are halted when one man falls to the ground, whom Galadriel almost decides to leave behind. Thondir tells her that they should have been at the stronghold by now, but that there is nothing there. But then in a moment of perfectly convenient timing, Lightning flashes again, revealing they already are. And how were they not seeing this all of the other times the lightning was flashing? I guess elf eyes aren't a thing in this show? Yet, even with the absence of binocular vision, I struggle to believe no one in this company spotted these towers. They're quite large. It's almost as if this momentary blindness was manufactured so that in a moment of greatest doubt, Galadriel could be proven right. The elves enter the stronghold, and one of Galadriel's men, whom I'm guessing feels somewhat frostbitten, puts his torch near his freezing hand and states that it's past feeling. 
But then Galadriel corrects him with this gem of a line. No. This place is so evil, our torches give off no warmth. <laughs> is this evil mechanic something she has experience with? And if so, how does her company not? Have they not been with her all of these years? Or does she know it intuitively? I tend to think that's the suggestion the show is making. But exactly how limited or unlimited is this evil's heat-sucking powers? Does it extend to the heat from the sun? What about the temperature of one's body? How even is the fire remaining alight when there is no heat? A fire's minimum temperature is several hundred degrees. And you know, Sauron is supposed to be a pretty evil guy. Do his signatures not include a flaming eye and a fiery mountain? And is Mount Doom not where Sauron forges the Great Rings, including the One? Wouldn't a lack of heat be a hindrance to that? Now, the likely reality is that the writers are attempting to make the situation feel more ominous, which is entirely unnecessary and ultimately quite useless. These elves are at a very high altitude and in the middle of a blizzard, so there's no reason to establish anything further about the freezing conditions of the place they're in, and given that it's a stronghold of Sauron's, we're well aware that evil was done here. That seems sufficiently ominous to me. But instead of simply relying on these factors to give the audience a sense of their circumstances, they throw in a line about evil causing torches to give off no warmth and have thus damaged the world building. I wish none of this had happened. Galadriel finds a doorway frozen over, then using her fist, punches through a rather thick layer of ice like Ivan Drago on steroids. Jeez. Who needs Gron to breach a gate? They enter into what appears to be a room used for smithing and oh good gourd. Well folks, I stand corrected. Heat sucking evil is apparently no hindrance at all to the art of blacksmithing. I am dead inside. And then Galadriel, for some inscrutable reason, eyeballs a random snowflake as it falls onto an anvil, sizzling once it lands. Oh, so it's the tools themselves that are hot. Well, that makes no sense at all, and there are literally thousands of snowflakes falling all around, and given that fact, why isn't the sizzling sound happening constantly? Was it really so important to capture that lone snowflake's journey downward? You know, it's almost as though they're making decisions that revolve around shots rather than logic. Galadriel pours somehow unfrozen water onto the anvil and, oh, look at that. There appears to be the same mark that Sauron put upon her dead brother. He was here. Sauron was here. Well, yeah, it's a stronghold of Sauron's. Why is him having been here before some big revelation? Tell the others to rest while they can. At sunrise we move on. Let's take the search farther north. Further north? Yes, why further north? What's the reasoning behind her certainty in the direction they must head in? This mark was left as a trail for orcs to follow. The last time I saw it was on my brother. I thought the symbol's meaning was indiscernible to even the wisest of elves. And now finally seeing it again, she somehow understands this to be a trail for the orcs to follow? Wasn't this symbol carved into Fenrod in the possession of the elves? How can she be sure the orcs ever saw it? And how does the random appearance of this centuries later automatically lead her to assume that this is a trail? How does she know which is point A and which is point B? What if the trail actually leads south rather than north? Or perhaps they are at point B, but point C is east or west. I simply do not understand how she can possibly come to this conclusion with so little information, as there seems to be quite a few possibilities. If it truly was Sauron's plan to lead his orcs in this direction, this is the worst breadcrumb trail I can imagine having to follow. It is a pickle, no doubt about it. One of the other elves finds bones lying about and soon after is attacked by a snow troll. He regroups with a few other elves and then a giant chunk of ice is lobbed at them and the impact alerts the commander. She runs in and sees the beast laying waste to her companions. After waiting a full 18 seconds as the troll takes out six of them, she decides to spring into action. Now, I know 18 seconds might not seem like a very long time, and I will even grant that the first five elves get wiped out in the first eight. But after those eight seconds, 
more than enough time has passed to react to the situation, especially since a sixth man is about to get smashed up against a wall. Well, we're waiting. Thondir puts down his sword like a ramp, she leaps up onto it, and is launched a good 15 to 20 feet into the air, goes over the troll, slashes its back on the way down, does a flashy sword twirly thingy, rolls past it while slicing at the ankle, gives it a backward slash, swipes down on its noggin, stabs the chin, twists, then pulls the blade, gives one more sword twirly, and then gives it a boop with a knife. Eat your heart out, Legolas. Where did Galadriel even receive this level of training? And why? Assuming Galadriel had a trainer at all, as I still cannot rule out the possibility that the show wants us to understand that she's just this good naturally, what was the purpose of her instruction if the intention wasn't to put her in the fight from the moment she was of age? I just watched her take out a troll in less time than it took for that same beast to demolish six other elves. Why weren't all of the other elves trained in these same fighting arts? Send in a legion of warriors this skilled and I imagine the war ends far sooner. Oh, and back to Galadriel, why didn't she and Fenrod tag team that search for Sauron? Probably would have improved the odds. She then wastes no time telling her company that they march at first light, paying no heed to the injured. And finally, rightfully, understandably, they have finally had enough of her. Thondir and the others set down their swords and tell her she can journey alone. This is thus far the most sensible thing that has happened in the first 20 minutes. She's shown herself to be a pathetic excuse for a leader who inspires no one, cares for no one, and given her fighting prowess, appears to need no one. She stares awkwardly again, and the title card finally appears across the screen. That's right. We've only just reached the title card. Next, we travel to Rovanian, the wilderlands east of the Anduin, where a pair of hunters trek across a field. One makes mention that there's nothing to hunt and wolves in every thicket, which to him seems strange. Personally, I'd call it strange to suggest there's nothing to hunt after you've poached the horns off of an apparently huge animal, but I suppose those didn't count. Something runs behind where they walk and startles them. One of the hunters says it could be a badger or a fox, while the other says it's more likely a harfoot, creatures that do not like to be seen. Oh, interesting, so we're about to see some deadly beasts of some kind? We might finally have something interesting on our hands. Ugh! Never mind. Some dirty little people emerge from the grass and hollowed out trees, and thus we've been introduced to the harfoots, who are totally not hobbits, and whose ability to set up and take down their encampment with tremendous speed and efficiency is in no way absurd. One of the female Harfeet is seen calling for someone named Nori. Soon after, we meet Sadak, who is the apparent leader of this lot. He looks into a book filled with symbols that I'm guessing represent their language and questions why there would be travelers around at that time of the year. Does Sadak require some kind of almanac to keep track of the current seasons or the traveling habits of outsiders? I mean, there are only four seasons, and if you happen to be in one where you do not typically see such people, why would you need a book to remember this? What's more, you'll find that most everyone in the Harfinkel community already recognizes that travelers at this time of the year is an unusual phenomena. Do you remember the scene in The Fellowship of the Ring where Gandalf travels to Minas Tirith? After having watched his friend Bilbo disappear, then become enraged at the thought of giving up his magic ring, Gandalf becomes suspicious that this ring might be that of Sauron. He pours over books and scrolls until he finds the information he's looking for, and then, to the benefit of the audience, what he reads is said aloud so we can know precisely what clue might prove his suspicions. My point in bringing this up is that having a similar voiceover for whatever Sadak is reading might have proved useful to understanding what concerns him. A group of harpies surround him, one declaring this to be an omen, and that the last time travelers came that early, there was a great frost. Sadak dismisses her and says the men must have gotten lost. The one who had been shouting for Nori is revealed to be named Goldie, and she tells her husband that the Wee Ones are still out there. He says not to worry because Nori is with them, and... You know Nori. Yes, I do. And as per a typical Hollywood script, this is the aforementioned character's cue to appear. 
And there's 110 things out here that could kill us. 111 if we kill you worrying to death. Hmm, that's an oddly specific number. That wouldn't happen to be some kind of weak, contrived reference to Bilbo's age in the Fellowship of the Ring, would it? Today is my 100th birthday! <laughs> <sighs> well, that's hardly juicy enough to even be called a member berry. That's practically a raisin. Two pieces of wood part, and we see the face of Nori. If we didn't do everything we weren't supposed to do, we'd hardly do anything at all. She's adventurous. Behind Nori comes her friend Poppy. She's clumsy. And thus we have the wish version of Frodo and Sam. Enchanting. Nori leads the way for Poppy and five little children. They find bushes full of berries and begin eating and collecting them. One child spots a large animal track and points it out to Nori, who is clearly worried but reassures the little one that it's just a dog track. Then just above her, we see an animal move out of sight in well-timed fashion. Nori begins to round everyone up, quietly telling Poppy about the nearby danger, and they leave to return home. As they do so, we catch a brief glimpse of the animal, which appears to be something very different from a wolf. Now we move over to Linden, the capital city of the High Elves, where we watch a male elf writing on a scroll. But not just any melf, this is Elrond himself. Hey, that rhymes. He appears to be trying to find the right words, muttering to himself various possibilities for what to put down. <laughs> Finally, something I can relate to. He is approached by two messengers, and they relay that the council regrets to inform him that he isn't permitted to attend their next session. Elf lords only. What? Elrond then receives worse news. Galadriel has arrived in Linden. <sighs> Things were so much more pleasant without her. Galadriel is found looking upon a painting which depicts a ship crossing over to the Undying Lands. They greet one another and Elrond looks upon the artwork, saying he has heard that when one crosses over, they hear a song and that you are immersed in a light more intoxicating than any sensation in all of Middle-earth. How touching. Uh, they do know we've seen Galadriel as a child, right? It was just 20 minutes ago. That doesn't appear to be the face of intoxication. I half expected you to arrive caked in grime and mud. This time frostbite and troll blood and no armor. Complaining about frostbite after the fact when you ignored such things in your men? And you wonder why they refused to fight for you. Also, does a company of less than 10 elves qualify as an army? Heck, a platoon typically requires something like 20 to 50 soldiers. Then again, I suppose we should be thankful that the writers didn't decide to call it a fellowship. Galadriel then shows Elrond a piece of paper with Sauron's mark on it, stating that its very existence proves Sauron escaped. Again, no it doesn't. It just proves there are two of them she's seen as of yet. All the same, she is certain he's out there and intends to ask the king for a fresh lot of soldiers. Elrond protests, stating that she's only just arrived and yet is already talking about leaving. He also reminds her that she defied the High King, and yet despite this, he has decided to honor her accomplishments rather than focus on her insolence, and that to test him again would be a foolish idea. And now we're back with the Hobfoots. Nori has returned with her siblings to their encampment and is told of the travelers that pass through. Right up on that ridge. I can't believe I missed them. Didn't she just have a near encounter with a wolf or warg or whatever that beast was? Isn't that comparatively more exciting than a couple of guys wearing moose horns? Nori and Goldie speak, and Goldie, who I'm guessing is the stepmother, chides her for going to the old farm again. I was careful, but the children might not be. I'm sorry, I didn't know. What an odd response. You didn't know that children sometimes aren't careful? If that's the case, then it's a wonder why they'd be put in your care at all. Nori then comments that they never get hunters up there before the harvest, reinforcing one of my earlier observations about how it seems all of these people are aware that it's strange for travelers to be here at this time of the year, making it odd that Sadak would need to check a book to realize this. I wonder if there's trouble down south. And what concern is that of yours, Eleanor Brandyfoot? Nori answers by asking Goldie if she has ever wondered what else is out there, how far the rivers flow, or where sparrows learn new songs and yada yada yada. Once again, the show is telling us that Nori is adventurous. But you know, most people tend to live in a single spot for several years, some even all their lives. 
From what I can gather, it seems that the Harfuls are a nomadic people and, as we're about to be told, have their paths dictated by the seasons. So even if the suggestion here is that they wander to these same spots over and over, that's really not so unadventurous. Sure, I can understand the idea of a person curious about the goings-on in the rest of the world and a fascination with peoples unlike themselves, but at the same time, the nature of the Harfoots should still, at least to a certain extent, scratch that adventurous itch she feels. Goldie then says that she's told Nori countless times that elves have their forest to protect, dwarves their mines, men their fields of grain. Even trees have to worry about the soil beneath their roots. But the Harfoots are free from the worries of the wide world. They are but ripples in a long, long stream. Their paths set by the passing seasons. Nobody goes off trail, and nobody walks alone. We have each other. We're safe. That is how we survive. No, you're not free from the worries of the world. You just said your people aren't allowed to walk alone or go off trail. And the mere sight of travelers sent your entire people into hiding. And you said that failure to do so jeopardizes your survival. That's far from being free from the worries of the world. If anything, you have more than most. And what are you even talking about when you say a tree has to worry about the soil beneath its roots? Even if the tree is a sentient being, and this being Middle Earth, that's not so far-fetched, but if it were, it's rooted in the ground. It has absolutely no say over its soil and no cause to worry about it. It doesn't even make sense as a hypothetical. Please stop putting retarded words into your characters' mouths. Back in the elf capital, Galadriel and her company are being honored by the High King Gilgalad. He gives a speech and we see Elrond mouthing the words exactly, telling us that this is what Elrond was writing earlier when we first saw him. He and Galadriel share a look and a grin, and while I wouldn't call this moment funny, nor any other moment in this episode, it does show that she's at least capable of a bit of mirth. More of this might have made her more endearing rather than repellent. Gilgalad continues, saying that this company has proven beyond any doubt that the days of war are over, which makes our heroine look uneasy. She even strains to bow so the king may honor her with a crown of golden leaves. And then, much to Galadriel's dismay, he announces that as a show of gratitude for centuries of service to her and her soldiers, they will be given the honor of being escorted back to the Grey Havens to dwell in peace for all eternity. At last, they are going home! As the rest of the elves celebrate, Galadriel visits a monument to her brother. We then see her sheath her brother's knife, which I suppose is meant to punctuate her having made a resolution. Elrond comes along with some wine to celebrate with his friend. Galadriel asks if he's going to just stand there like an orc. And while I can't say I know what stand there like an orc means, it's at least one more minor instance where she doesn't come off like a harpy. It is said the wine of victory is sweetest for those in whose bitter trials it is fermented. Aren't all victories the result of a trial of some kind to begin with? So wouldn't that make all wines of victory similarly fermented? I do not feel victorious. Well, neither do the viewers, hon. You deserve the honors of this day. Her brother would be proud. I'm genuinely curious if that would be true. I mean, sure, she's slain orcs and trolls and has spent a long time hunting a great enemy. But would her seemingly gentle-natured brother be happy to see his sister care nothing for the lives of her fellow elves? Draw rational conclusions based upon bare-bones evidence? One could certainly argue that her cause is both just and for the betterment of the world. But it also seems that she's losing her humanity, and not even as a direct result of her duty, but rather through stubbornness and a severe lack of both empathy and humility. Of course, I'm fairly certain the writers would disagree with that summation, but that just leads me to question those same qualities in them. Anyway, let's move on. I remember when the first of these were carved. The likeness of one fallen preserved upon a living thing. And I suppose some part of me always believed my rest would be here. With them. But instead I am to leave them. That's actually not a bad line. In fact, I'd even go so far as to say I kind of liked it. It seems to imply that, like the image carved from wood, a certain likeness of Galadriel's brother is imprinted upon another living thing, that being her, which is actually an interesting comparison for her to make and indicative of the burden she carries. And her belief that she'd one day join them and the expressing of survivor's guilt 
is fairly well summed up in these few sentences. Finally, a moment of quality dialogue that I can appreciate. This is the gift of your king. A gift I have decided to refuse. Galadriel tells Elrond that her brother gave his life hunting Sauron and that his task is now hers. She goes to seek the enemy that escaped them in the north, and she will seek him alone if she must. Ah yes, your mystery sigil. I shared it with the High King. Then why would it- Because seeing a sigil does not mean you're any closer to finding Sauron. Exactly, Elrond. Thank you. Finally someone saying it. It is over. The evil is gone. Then why is it not gone from in here? Now, I, like you, am aware that she is right and Elrond wrong, but what our protagonist doesn't seem to grasp is that it isn't enough for you to feel it in your heart or your gut if you're trying to convince others to help you. You need more than a pair of marks whose meaning you don't understand. People aren't going to risk life, limb, or resources if you cannot adequately present your case. And what's especially frustrating here is that it really seems as though the show expects us to side with Galadriel simply because she is going to be proven right. The problem with this notion is that if you cannot support your point of view, then you'll only be right accidentally, which is not commendable. After all you have endured, it is only natural to feel conflicted. Conflicted? What was that face? Did somebody fart and she caught a whiff? Or was that her impersonation of a bunny? And also, what is so wrong about this statement? Is it not an accurate description of how she is feeling about the choice that is before her? I am grateful you have not known evil as I have. But you have not seen what I have seen. That's a bit redundant. I have seen my share. You have not seen what I have seen. Ugh, why is she saying this? Why is she like this? Aside from it sounding like competitive suffering, what qualifies this remark? Is it because she lost her beloved brother? Well, Galadriel, maybe you forgot that massive pile of helmets from earlier in the episode, but we can be certain that plenty of other elves have suffered great losses. Heck, there are probably quite a few that lost even more loved ones than yourself. Are they of a similar mind about Sauron as you? Or perhaps Galadriel means that she has seen terrible things that Elrond struggles to believe but again, she can't have been the only person to have seen them. She's been leading other elves for centuries, so it stands to reason that they have seen the same things she has. And last I checked, they are quite as unconvinced of Galadriel's assertions as Elrond. Their back and forth continues as she insists that evil does not sleep, whereas Elrond argues that seeking Sauron will not satisfy her. And if she is wrong, then she'd be leading other elves to die in far-off lands. He also warns her that if she were to refuse the call home, she'd be the first in their history to do so and would become an outcast, poisoned in dark whispers and in dreams. She suggests that her fate would be no better in the West, which is strange after she said not too long ago that the only feeling one knows in Valinor is that of intoxicating joy. It shouldn't take Elrond telling her that she would find healing there in order for her to know it. He also assures her that if but a whisper of the threat she perceives proves true, he will not rest until it is proven right. In other words, he is ready to take up the mantle for her if need be. And to that she responds with... She really needs to cut that out. You have fought long enough, Galadriel. Put up your sword. Without it, what am I to be? Yeah, what? What? What are you to be? Are the writers suggesting that Galadriel is nothing more than a sword? Is she merely to live and die by it, and are we supposed to cheer her onward to this kind of fate as though it's somehow honorable? Personally, I find this not only ridiculous, but honestly somewhat insulting to the character J.R.R. Tolkien wrote, as well as piss poor in comparison to the Galadriel portrayed by Kate Blanchett in Peter Jackson's movie trilogy. Mr. Jackson, the writers, and Miss Blanchett portrayed Galadriel with dignity and regality, but also kindness, vulnerability, wisdom, and caring. All of this while also not forgetting that she is both mysterious and powerful. And this was done in fewer than 15 minutes of total screen time in Fellowship of the Ring. She goes from being a figure that one isn't sure the Fellowship can trust, to being one of the most memorable and wonderful characters in the entire movie, and even the trilogy as a whole. Elves in Tolkien's mythos are very similar to angels in Christianity, 
and no other portrayal comes as close to matching that comparison than Kate Blanchett's Lady Galadriel. So where is that here? How do we go from that to this? This is not Galadriel. It's an imposter! An imposter! <sighs> At least we're cutting away now. Oh, and look, we're going somewhere entirely new. We come to the Southlands, aka the Lands of Men, and the transition from the showing of this on the map to the pan across a small village with mountains in the background is perhaps the loveliest shot of the episode. A pair of elves make their way into the town. Some humans look at them with clear distaste, some with apparent interest, and others address them cordially. They walk past a pair playing a chess or checkers-like board game, and one of the elves tells the person whose turn it is a move that wins him the game. Bit of a dick move, if you ask me. One elf enters a tavern where some men are speaking of someone or something having been poisoned, though they halt their conversation at the appearance of their visitor. He pulls back his hood and the owner greets him, calling him Arondir. The owner, whose name is Waldrig, tells Arondir that he has little to report this go-round. A rather comely woman then shares a look with the elf and then leaves while Waldrig tells him that there was a fight over a girl but Arondir is uninterested and instead asks about the poisoning they were talking about. Waldrig says that it was just a person passing through that had said that his grazing's gone rotten. Arondir continues to press with questions until a younger man chimes up with, Let it go, knife is. That's right. This town has a slur for the elves, knife ears. Personally, I'd call this more creatively offensive than racially offensive, but I cannot discern the elves' attitude towards it. The lot you lump us in with died off a thousand years ago. When are you people gonna let the past go? What do you mean, you people? Okay, so it seems that the elves and these humans, or perhaps humans in general, have a tense relationship based upon past events. But also, and I doubt I have to state the obvious, it appears whomever wrote this is attempting to remind us of our own real-world race relations as this fellow's statement is not so different from a hypothetical white person, in no way made of straw, rolling his or her eyes and stating that a black person needs to let the past go because slavery ended over a hundred years ago. Here's a nice pat on the head for subtlety, Amazon. Though I cannot help but notice something off in this exchange and how it works against such overt messaging. You see... The type of intellectual retards that write dialogues such as this are the same that will tell you that a black person cannot be racist against a white person because of power dynamics. However, if they believe that, then they might have written this scene quite differently, as there can be no doubt that the elves are clearly the beings with power when compared with these humans. So the only way this scene works for their apparent messaging is if it actually agrees with the human. But given that his insults are directed at an elf played by a black actor, I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that the writers don't agree with the white guy. Plus, this was us all. Whether we like it or not. <sighs> Does anybody have an Advil? One day, our true king will return. Yes, and I'm sure he'll come with red hats and make the Southlands great again, too. And pry us right out from under your pointy boots. Can these humans learn to make observations that go beyond acute angles when insulting the elves? Pointy isn't exactly an adjective that elicits hostility. In fact, it was used in a jocular fashion in the two towers. Ah! I have no pointy yet, I'm scoring me! Ah! Don't tell me this show is calling Gimli a racist now. That was not so courteous. Waldrig tries to calm the young man, but he seems ready to throw down. Arondir stops Waldrake from striking him and defuses the situation, then he leaves. Outside, he sees the pretty lady with whom he exchanged a look and goes over to her as she is standing by a well. This fetching lass is Bronwyn. Hello, nurse! Bronwyn gives Arondir flower seeds she says she received from another healer and hey, she really is a nurse! She then asks if there are healers amongst the elves, and he confirms there are, and that they are called artificers. Most wounds to our bodies heal of their own accord, so it is their labor instead to render hidden truths as works of beauty. Wait, is he saying that their healers just make pretty things and that makes sick or dying elves feel better? Would a boob pick have saved Fenrod? I'm genuinely confused at what Arondir means though I obviously caught that he made a point at looking right at Bronwyn when he brought up beauty, 
Wait a minute, is he coming on to me? Waldrick comes outside and our pair here quickly separate so as not to betray their obvious flirtations, though the old man seems wise to it. Arondir meets back up with the other elf he arrived with and tells him there's nothing out of the ordinary to report. His friend then asks about the well, indicating he saw his advances at the lady. And how did he see this exactly? Was he spying on them or can he see through obstructions? That well is behind the tavern. <laughs> Elf eyes are really inconsistent in the show. Arondir dismisses these concerns and says his friend talks too much and that he smells of rotten leaves. <laughs> is this an attempt to create an elf specific insult of some kind? I mean, it's not the worst idea to try and do so, I guess, but rotten leaves? Good bird. We now cut over to a watchtower, which appears to be a good distance from the village, and Arondir's friend is still going on about his girlfriend. How long have they been having this conversation? The other elf reminds him that only twice in history has an elf and a human coupling been attempted, and that both times it ended in death. Now, I can understand why elves would have concerns about coupling with humans, just for the difference in lifespan alone, but two attempts at this ending in death, uh, I'm not sure if that's nearly enough attempts to begin to believe that the correlation and causation go hand in hand. Thankfully, this conversation is interrupted by a messenger who tells them that the High King has declared that the days of war are over, and that all of the far outposts are being disbanded. This means the elves are leaving the Southlands and going back home. Arondir appears none too happy about this. Gonna need some beauty to bring those spirits back up. We next see him atop the watchtower where he is joined by the watch warden, who asks Arondir if he's taking a last look. 79 years I've been stationed here. I suppose I've grown accustomed to it. They speak of how the place has changed, but then the watch warden warns. But the men who live here have not. The blood of those who stood with Morgoth still darkens their veins. Morgoth was defeated centuries ago. Has anything happened with these men since? An uprising? Any outbreaks of violence? I suppose I can understand keeping an outpost at a place where you once had enemies, but after centuries and generations of men coming and going, you think they haven't changed simply because of what their ancestors did? And if such a belief is common amongst the elves, and I admit I'm not sure it is, then why would they abandon the outpost at all? Wouldn't they fear they'd be leaving a potential enemy unattended? That was long ago, Watch Warden. Yes, it was, Arondir. That's a point the young man in the tavern made to you only minutes ago. But mark this, Arondir. That for 79 years you've kept watch over the men and women of Tiharad, not because of what their ancestors once did, but because of who they still are. These elves are an unpleasant lot, aren't they? And what's kind of amusing about this is that Arondir is acting as though he doesn't agree with the Watch Warden which would be rather sensible except for the fact that just a few minutes ago in the tavern, he told the young man, Past this was us all, whether we like it or not. Pick a side, knife ears. Watch Warden tells him to be grateful he doesn't have to see them again, but clearly Arondir's having none of that, as a few minutes later he heads to the home of his hush-hush healer hussy. She and her son Theo are making medicines while the young lad complains about rats keeping him awake the night before. They see the elf approaching, the boy asks what is one of them doing here in a you people sort of way, and then his mother goes out to meet him. She says she heard the elves were leaving, which he confirms, then asks where the rest of his company are, to which Arondir replies, Most likely searching for me, at this very moment. If they are looking for him, will it put them in any danger, meaning the guilt for unintended consequences will fall upon Arondir? Something to look out for, I guess. Say what you wish to say. I have said it already, a hundred times over, in every way but words. Her son interrupts this exchange, informing his mother that she has a visitor. She goes to meet the man who has with him a sick cow. Bronwyn asks where the cow has been grazing, and he answers, She wandered east a few days ago. Arondir milks one of the udders, and a nasty black liquid squirts out. He asks how far east, and is told that it could be as far as Hordern, which seemingly concerns the elf. He readies to head in that direction, and Bronwyn declares that she is going with him. Upon overhearing this, Theo leaves the home and heads to a nearby barn with a friend. He makes mention of spotting an object there by mistake, having stepped onto a lucky board. As he removes said board, the other boy asks about Theo's mother and the elf, 
saying it's what everyone's talking about. Theo says it's a lie, but his friend retorts that maybe the elf is the reason Theo's father ran off. Theo brings up an object wrapped in cloth, and it appears to be a sword hilt with a broken blade. His friend eagerly reaches for it before it is pulled away, and then, as Theo lifts the object into view, we see engraved upon the blade is the sigil of Sauron. <laughs> Hang on. What just happened? Where is this scene even coming from? Why didn't we see the boy stumble upon this item earlier? Who does this barn even belong to, and what brought Theo to it in the first place? Also, did Galadriel and her company ever search this region? It is, after all, a place that allied itself with Morgoth and one the elves felt compelled to keep watch over for centuries since. And if they have searched the area, how did they never come upon this poorly hidden object? It really seems like we're missing a lot of information. Let's face it, Mr. Frodo. We're lost. Now we have come to the sea where Galadriel and her company of elves are sailing to the Grey Havens. And as we can see, they are dressed in full armor, standing in formation, swords in hand pointing down. And how long have they been like this exactly? And for how much longer are they supposed to? Is it even necessary that they pose this way, or is this just some kind of hero shot? Maybe elves don't cramp up, but I imagine this would get uncomfortable after a while. Why are you repeating? Why are you repeating? Back with Elrond, he declares that Galadriel has passed beyond his sight. Galadriel was so certain her search should continue. Was she? I never got that impression. Elrond is speaking to King Gilgalad, who I'd like to say I think is a bit miscast here. Actor Benjamin Walker's appearance is that of a younger Liam Neeson. He even played a junior version of one of Neeson's characters in the 2004 biopic about esteemed intellectual pervert and all-around deviant Alfred Kinsey. My point is that elves tend to be physically leaner and Walker's bulkiness makes his makeup and garb look off in a way that I had a hard time overlooking. If he were the lead singer of a metal band and doing some video where he was supposed to wear Supreme Leader Snoke's robe, then perhaps it would be more fitting. Gilgalad tells Elrond that he and the High Council foresaw that if she continued her search, she might have inadvertently kept alive the very evil she sought to defeat. I'm struggling to understand why someone wouldn't tell Galadriel that if she persists, she could make things worse. She's an elf, so I assume she understands that some of her people have the gift of foresight. And heck, she's operating on the belief that Sauron is still a threat based solely on a feeling, is she not? Sure, it's perfectly possible she might not heed such a warning, but wouldn't it make sense to still give it to her? Well, the same wind that seeks to blow out a fire may also cause its spread. I wonder how many fortune cookies the writers had to crack open to plagiarize that line. And the shadow she sought, you believe it does exist? Another fair question to ask after Gilgalad's statement. Set your mind at peace about it. What you did was right. For Galadriel and for Middle-earth. Hang on, set your mind at peace about it? You basically just confirmed that you and I'm assuming the High Council are aware that Sauron still roams Middle-earth. Why then are you calling back your elves to Linden and declaring the war to be over? It'd be one thing if you just needed to get Galadriel out of the way because of what you foresaw, but are you really not going to resume the hunt for this great foe who is exceedingly dangerous and already responsible for a multitude of deaths? Why would they make Gilgalad and the High Council not merely wrong about Sauron, but intentionally negligent? Well, you got me. By all accounts, it doesn't make sense. Elrond, who far too quickly drops the subject of Sauron being alive, says that it is hard to know what is right when friendship and duty are mingled. Gilgalad responds by telling him that this is the burden of those who lead and those who would seek to. Galadriel sails into the sunset while they must look to the new sunrise. To that end, are you acquainted with the work of Lord Celebrimbor? The greatest of Elven Smiths, of course. Got that, audience? Gilgalad informs Elrond that Celebrimbor is to embark upon a new project of singular importance, and that Elrond has been chosen to work with him. But I'll allow you to explain the details, Lord Celebrimbor. And then into the frame walks the famed Elvish smith himself. <laughs> this is supposed to be a blacksmith? Not exactly forged in fire material, is he? Here's an idea. Can we possibly swap the actors for him and Gilgalad? 
I can buy the idea of someone with Benjamin Walker's physique as a blacksmith. No disrespect intended for Charles Edwards, the actor portraying Celebrimbor, but he looks like he'd faint after about five minutes in a sauna, let alone work in a forge. Heck, I'd sooner believe this guy would be a smith. And yeah, we're back with the hard farts. And this little scene is barely worth mentioning, so I'll sum it up quickly. Sadak says the stars are weird. He looks into the book again. Nori pops up and asks what he's going on about. He suggests that she might be part squirrel because, again, she's adventurous. And then he tells her... The skies are strange. And scene. And now we're back with forced fever. Arondir asks Bronwyn how familiar she is with the townsfolk of Hordern. Very, I should hope. I was born there. Have these two only met recently, or have they spoken a lot over the many years he's been stationed there? It certainly seems to be the latter, since they've pretty strongly suggested that the two of them have fallen for one another. Isn't where were you born kind of a first date question? The people of Hordon were known for having been especially strong in the loyalty to Mordor. I guess that sort of explains why Arondir was concerned when the owner of the cow told him where it was grazing. At least a little bit. Though it does raise the question of why the elves weren't being more watchful of that part of the region. Or maybe they were, and it simply hasn't come up that the elves are stationed there. Though, since they're all supposed to be leaving to go home, if anything were wrong in that area, surely it would have been reported before they departed? The messenger at least would have passed through, right? You'd think so, wouldn't ya? Bronwyn is somewhat affronted that Arondir has brought up this ugly truth about her birthplace, stating, I'm talking about my friends. Actually, he was talking about their ancestors, but then again, with the elves, that's pretty much one and the same. So yeah, Arondir thinks your friends are shit. That is why I'm here with you, instead of the Watchwood. The only kind touch I've known all my days. Sounds like these two know each other, and perhaps the biblically sinful pre-marital sense of the word? Though I suppose this affair is probably somewhat new, since it seems to be a fresh topic of conversation both with the elves and the townsfolk. Probably should still know where she was born, though, if he's been getting more than herbs from her garden. Then, just as it appears Arondir and Bronwyn are about to share a kiss, Arondir tilts his head up and notices smoke rising from beyond the hill. They rush up to the top and see that Hordern has been set ablaze. And how did they not already spot this? Who keeps flipping the on-off switch for elf eyes? Heck, if the owner of the sick cow knew his animal had grazed that far, how did he not notice? But no time to worry about that now, as we're back on the water with Galadriel and her men. And they're still holding that pose. Dear, that must be terribly uncomfortable. The swords are taken from them and laid at their feet. Then their armor removed as they come ever closer to the entrance of Valinor. One elf attempts to take Fenrod's blade from Galadriel, but she hesitates to let go. She's scary. Galadriel finally relents and hands it over. Birdies fly overhead and the skies part, engulfing the ship in golden light as the other elves begin to sing. They look upon the sight in awe, but Galadriel looks down at her brother's blade and now begins to remember the words he uttered at the beginning of the episode as they echo in her memory. As this is happening, a meteor races across the sky and we cut between regions of the world and those who watch it happen. First, we see Elrond, Gilgalad, and Celebrimbor noticing it from Lindor. Next, it passes into view of Bronwyn and Arondir, and they sort of join hands as it does. We get an overhead view from a forest where it appears there are Ents watching this event occur. And then we come back to Galadriel, and she has begun to step backward, as if she means to abandon ship. Her company of elves join hands, and one tells Galadriel to take his. She hesitantly reaches for it, but then again looks down at the blade, remembering her question to her brother all those years ago. How am I to know which lies to follow? And now we're allowed to know the answer. Fenrod's profound response, which ultimately makes Galadriel reject her opportunity to return to the Undying Lands and continue her quest to hunt Sauron. And that response is... Sometimes we cannot know until we have touched the darkness. What? No. No, no, no. 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 No! That cannot be his answer. What would Fenrod have known about touching the darkness? There was no darkness. No death. No evil the elves had yet touched. If this conversation had taken place after the conflict with Morgoth had already begun, okay then, 
The ship metaphor is still stupid, but at least the mechanics of the world they inhabit informs the lesson. But again, that is not how it was written. As far as I can tell, what they wanted was the shock of death becoming a reality for the elves, as well as this cheap justification for why Galadriel decides to leave the ship by circling back to this scene at the conclusion of this chapter. It also appears they wanted Galadriel to forfeit perhaps her only opportunity to enter the elvish version of heaven, thereby giving her this noble sacrifice that would presumably endear her to us. The problem with this is that they've spent the entire episode portraying her as both irrational and insufferable, so I doubt any person with an idea of heaven would begin to think she belongs there in the first place. Perhaps someplace warmer would better suit her. <laughs> Following her brother's answer, Galadriel gives the entrance to Valinor those horrible eyes and then turns them right towards the camera. The meteor then passes over the hemp farms and slams down upon the earth. One quick question. A moment ago when Sadak was looking up at the sky and saying it was strange, wouldn't it have made sense to show the beginnings of this meteor's descent? Just show something distant and flickering, and as a result his dialogue comes off as less vague. That's a good idea. At the same time as the meteor's impact, Galadriel dives into the sea, dagger in hand. It's worth noting that Galadriel is really, really far out to sea with no boat in sight and miles between herself and the shore. And I'm fairly certain this show has established that elves experience fatigue. So Galadriel abandoning ship in the middle of the ocean is incredibly stupid and, uh, yeah, she's dead. We haven't even accounted for possible dangerous sea creatures or sharks, and none of that should make any difference. Short of a ridiculous stroke of luck, our heroine was actually a herring, a red one, and I look forward to finding out who will be filling in as the protagonist. Good riddance. Uh, I knew it was too much to hope for. Cut back over to Gilgalad, and beside him a leaf falls slowly from a tree. This is the second time we've seen an elf follow a singular falling object, so I think we're just one away from this becoming a trend. He picks it up and turns it over, and we see that the leaf has a blackness coursing through its veins. Don't raise it! I do recall some referring to this as leaf cancer, and I honestly think that's the best possible description, so that's likely how I'll refer to it as well. Back to Nori, she walks up to the site where the meteor crashed, and wow, that's a pretty wide crater. Look at that thing. Wouldn't at least the sound of it be incredibly loud? Why is Nori the only one going to investigate this? I'm not even sure any other half-waffles woke up. Oh, and at the center of the impact crater lies an old and mostly naked man. And as the camera frames him overhead, the image looks suspiciously eye-like, more than hinting that this could be Sauron. The credits are just about to roll, but I cannot go without saying this. If you recall the beginning of this video, I stated that I had watched a good deal of coverage of Rings of Power while it was first airing, and that I was privy to a few spoilers. One of these includes the actual identity of Sauron, as well as this particular bit of misdirection. However, in writing this, I've attempted as best I can to look at the show from the perspective of someone who knew little to nothing at all about what was to come. And yet in pondering this moment, I cannot help but laugh at just how asinine it is that the show would even attempt to suggest that we even might be looking at Sauron. Think about it. He's already suspected to be hiding in Middle-earth, and we've been given a fair amount of history regarding his actions upon it. Why would he suddenly need to re-arrive encased in a meteorite? Unless he has a desperate need to fast travel and all that's at his disposal is a hollowed out rock and the world's most powerful trebuchet, the idea that this could be Sauron is preposterous. You don't require a foreknowledge of who Sauron is to realize this. And yet, given this show's lack of adherence to any sense of logic or consistency, had I not already known this wasn't Sauron, I would not be able to 100% rule him out as a candidate. So, on the one hand, I suppose I'll give them points for not following through with such silliness, but on the other, I'm taking those same points away for such a gross insult to the intelligence of the audience. Okay, now you can roll the credits.
Honestly, I haven't watched all that many TV shows in my life as I've always favored movies. But as far as first episodes are concerned, this is probably the worst pilot I've seen since 9-11. On a superficial level, there are some nice landscape shots and some mostly good special effects thus far. The musical score, however, is pretty forgettable, which is unfortunate when one considers how this category is typically a highlight for fantasy adaptations, often even for bad ones. I also think the costumes are a mixed bag at best. For example, while the townsfolk in the South are dressed more or less appropriately, their elvish counterparts wear an armor that I can't say I'm too fond of. Some of the prosthetics on these and a few other elves don't always look quite right either. Moving on to more important aspects, the dialogue tends to range from bland to embarrassing for the majority of the runtime, and this does little to help the performances of the actors. Though, as I've alluded to already, some of the problems there also come down to bad casting. Morphid Clark is thus far the most glaring example of this. While she certainly has the look of an elf and I think could possibly give a decent performance and a better written part, the role she's been given here just doesn't work at all. She's supposed to be hardened and severe, and yet the more she behaves this way, the more absurd it comes off. She's simply not believable as a warrior or leader, much less a hero of a story such as this. Nori is apparently supposed to be one of the leads, but aside from crashing a meteor nearby where she lives at the very end of the episode, all the show has managed to do is allude to her being adventurous. An adjective I'm fully aware that I'm repeating, because if Rings of Power can get away with reiterating the same quality, why should I bother describing it any differently? Elrond is probably the best of the primary characters introduced, and while I'm not at all a fan of the hairdo or costume worn by Robert Aramayo, I think he's mostly doing okay in the role thus far. Rondir and Bronwyn are our romantic leads, and while their courtship hasn't entered into cringe territory quite yet, though the scene by the well did toe the line, their actors have thus far performed in a fashion one could call wooden. Yet worse than any other aspect is the storytelling. A Shadow of the Past certainly manages to establish the motivations of its chief players, be it obligation or love or a desire for adventure, but it provides little reason for us to care or have faith that the payoff will prove worth the hassle of getting there. It might be too early to tell where it is going beyond some details I already know, but the framework and internal logic is so messy that by the time we arrive at certain points, it seems almost certain we'll be baffled as to how we arrived in the first place or why a different route wasn't taken. After spending an hour in this iteration of Middle-earth and spending several hours examining that one hour, I'm honestly not invested in a single character that I've met. And worse still, I'm actively against the show's protagonist, as she is one of the most unlikable heroes I've ever come across in a story. Another part of the job of a first episode of a TV show is to put in place ideas and to set things into motion and raise questions about where it will all go. Well, Rings of Power certainly did some of this, but the dreadful fashion in which it did so with its budget and source material to draw from is a spectacular failure that would require genuine effort to match. And yet I fear that the people behind this production might end up proving up to this terrible task. By the show's end, I felt as though I'd been shown a product more than a piece of art. And given that this is based upon the work of a genuine literary artist of the highest order, I came away from it feeling rather disgusted. By contrast, the movie trilogy was a labor of love, an adaptation focused on bringing to life what is possibly the most beloved piece of fantasy currently in existence. It was done with care and respect and a genuine desire to not just entertain audiences, but to introduce people such as myself to the wondrous world of Middle-earth. We could certainly argue over various omissions from the books, but there is little doubt of the good intentions behind the films. But we thought that we should honor Tolkien by putting his messages into it. And we thought he cared about things. We, you know, he, you know the countryside and the, and, the, and, and, and the rise of evil. And, and he, he cared passionately about certain issues. And we thought what we should do to honor him is to make sure that, that, that his, what he cared about ends up in the movie. That's what we tried to do. The production stories detailed in the special features section of the DVD Blu-ray are fascinating and well worth a watch if you're into that sort of thing. And they make the passion of Peter Jackson, the writers, the cast and crew, not only evident, but genuinely moving. 
Rings of Power, on the other hand, seems to have been designed simply to mooch off of the success of that trilogy and the name of Tolkien, as well as gain brownie points with social media mobs and socially conscious reviewers. And yes, believe it or not, despite every issue that is packed into this pathetic pile of trash, it actually does have its defenders amongst that crowd. Despite an audience score on Rotten Tomatoes of 38%, the numerical palindrome of that represents the critic score, and this percentage is drawn from almost 500 total reviews. I honestly didn't know Rotten Tomatoes had certified that many critics, but thankfully, one is still able to see the audience rating, which currently sits at 2.4 stars out of 5. A bit generous if you ask me, but at the same time, the average viewer isn't likely combing over details to the degree myself and others have. And yet as such a person, I find it incredibly frustrating just how many people employed in this medium are paid to write some of the vapid nonsense that passes for a review these days. Ones that are often heavy on adjectives rather than explanations, championing message and themes over storytelling, and with little to no evaluation of character or world building. An example from such a review about this episode came from Alex Stedman of IGN.com, who gave this episode a 7 out of 10. My favorite part is where she begins to remark about the cinematography, stating, What's stunning about the cinematography isn't just how meticulously it captures the diverse geography of Middle-earth, from snowy mountaintops to the bustling Casa Doom, but how it so intimately zeroes in on the actors' faces during important conversations. When Galadriel and Elrond are having a heated discussion, the camera catches Clark's lip twitch ever so slightly as she grows agitated while trying to maintain her composure. That verbosity, that flowery language, all for this scene. Now, as laughable as I happen to find this moment, it isn't inherently wrong that Alex enjoys it. However, why not go over the substance of that discussion they're having or the characters having it? Part of the reason that Twitch is so funny to me is because I find the character so detestable and cannot help but feel more inclined to poking fun at distasteful people rather than those whom I like. However, since Alex seems rather enthralled superficially with this close-up and seems to consider it artful that the twitch of her lip was captured, I cannot help but think she has some affection for Galadriel's character, so why not talk about both of these things in relation to one another? What's amusing is that she actually acknowledges that the first episode presents Galadriel as fairly one note and that, if you're not a Tolkien expert, you'd have little reason to get invested in the characters. I'd honestly be curious then why she'd rate the episode as good. And I'm even more curious about episode 2 in relation to her because <laughs> she gave it a 9 out of 10, which according to her employer scale means she found it amazing. I do hope she'll pardon my skepticism. As for myself, Rings of Power Episode 1 is frankly one of the most horrendous pieces of television I have ever consumed, and as much as I've enjoyed making this piece of content, the idea of watching six more of these episodes is how I imagine a walk to the gallows feels. Yet dreadful as the task may be, I plan to follow through with it. Good luck! <laughs> well, that wraps up the review. This took much longer to get out than usual, but the length should at least provide some insight as to why, as it's easily the longest video I've produced thus far. And now, we have finally come to the end. I thank you for indulging me with your valuable time and hope to see you again for the next video. Until then, God bless and Gord speed.